Movies, the final frontier. These are the Review of the Nerds. It's continuing channel theme to explore strange new movies, to seek out new and interesting characters, to analytically go where most nerds go all the time. I'm Vincent. And I'm Mike. And today we are reviewing Star Trek Beyond. We recently just did a ranking of all the movies up to this point. Uh, check out that video first if you would like. 13th film in the franchise and the 50th anniversary film. Directed by Justin Lin, the director of the Fast and the Furious franchise. J.J. Abrams had to step away for Star Wars, as we all know. Yep. And co-written by Simon Pegg, who plays Montgomery Scott. The movie is originally going to be written by Robert Orkey, who is the co-writer-producer of the uh, series uh, so far. Apparently the studio didn't like his script because they said, quote-unquote, it was too Star Trek-y. So Simon Pegg was brought on, and one of, the tasks, yeah, one of the tasks that they gave him was to make it more commercial. So, we got another fun ride. Alright, studio heads, yeah. Explosions and lens flares are back! <laughs> Alright, so this is the latest installment of the new franchise. The crew is about halfway through their five-year mission. Some of the crew members are going through questions of their destiny. When all of a sudden, they are attacked by an unknown force, destroying Enterprise and leaving them stranded on a planet. With no Enterprise to help them out, they have a fair way to stop this new enemy who has very big, devastating plans. One of the things I enjoy the most about this movie is that it truly feels like an ensemble this time. Whereas the first two, it seemed like they were just picking favorites to me. The circumstances of the crew abandoning the Enterprise and ending up on this planet forces them to mix and pair up. The combinations are fun, and they also give everyone a chance to shine. So we see in this new movie that a lot of the uh, actors, or I should say the characters, are finally, some of them are finally coming kind of into their own. You know, Kirk is no longer, is, he's still kind of got that rebellious streak in him a little bit, but now he is a Starfleet captain. He doesn't, you know, screw around as much. He still has his, like, you know, sense of humor, and he still, like, interacts with the crew the way he did before, but he's in command and he's sure of his moves and what he's doing. This is the, a captain of a Starfleet ship. I feel like Chris Pine's really coming to his own as a character. I feel like before, to some extent, he was always trying to live up to William Shatner, and this time it feels like his character. And strangely enough, even though he's not adding in those little William Shatner moments, this feels more like the Kirk we know from the classic series than ever before. Yeah. And I think it's because of how comfortable he feels in the role now. He's always been great, but I think that he's at his best in this one. Like, there's definitely moments of uh, fun in this movie with uh, Chris Pine. There's a very funny opening. And that was true for the main cast in general. They seem to feel more comfortable in their roles this time to me. Carl Urban is another example of this. I think he started out doing more of a DeForest Kelly impression rather than making the character of Bones his own. And even though he's a lot of fun to watch, it would make him feel more like a caricature than an actual character at times. There's still moments in this one where that is true. There are times where he's still doing it, but I think that he seemed much more natural. And it was also nice to see his role get expanded and be bigger in this one. I think that they really did a lot to develop him, and I really liked him in this one. I pretty much agree. Uh, yeah, I mean, uh, sometimes it is a little too comical the way he's acting uh, to try to be Bones, you know, off of what DeForest Kelly did. But at the same time, uh, he gets some good moments in this film, the character, because him and Spock have a bonding moment because they spend actually a lot of time with each other in this film. In the previous films, a lot of this, uh, a lot of the uh, relationship of the uh, bridge crew, a lot of it happened between uh, Kirk and Spock. But this time, Bones and Spock get a lot of time to just show that yes, they are friends as much as they drive each other crazy. That they do care about each other, and they're there to like help each other out, which is something that they, which is something that was a big thing in the original movies and TV series, and they've never really addressed in, in this new franchise. So I'm glad they finally did. It was just fine to see them act like friends. Yeah, and there's of course that love-hate relationship that everyone loves to see. I like the fact that they don't depend so heavily on trying to go like, Look, we're changing the timeline! We're taking things that you loved about the original and imploding them! <laughs> um, you know, this is its own thing. As a matter of fact, this could totally work as an original series episode or movie from the, with the original cast. There's nothing about this really that, that needed to be in the alternate new timeline, so it feels like a classic Trek story in that way. The only thing about the timeline that really comes up in this one is uh, Spock dying, uh, which Leonard Nimoy passed away, so they have a tribute to where Spock also passes away and affects 
uh, uh, young Spock's journey in this a little bit. Yeah. I still think Zachary Quinto is a great choice for Spock. Uh, I think he does a good job. I have no problems with him. I think I have some problems with the way that he's maybe written and directed sometimes. It seems like there's somewhat of a misunderstanding for the limitations of Spock uh, evoking and, and showing emotion. Uh, they have him show emotion way too much. There's, there's like a crying emotional release scene of, for Spock in every one of these movies so far. And to me that detracts from the character because whenever he had emotional releases in the show, it was always motivated by the pawn far, which is like the, the time when Vulcans are basically in heat, or it was motivated by a mind meld and an emotional transference. Uh, but the fact that he was always in control and calculating, and yet was able to convey emotions under, beneath the eyes, like more of a... You could still feel the emotion, but it was more reserved. That made him more interesting. I feel like this very open emotional displays that they, sh that they have Spock doing, something about it just isn't Spock. Part of that, I'm going to blame on the Uhura relationship, which I've never really been a fan of in this series. I feel like it humanizes Spock more than it should. It's the fact that Spock feels like... Uh, and as an outsider that, make, that made Spock so relatable to people throughout the original series. What I'll say about him in a horror situation is that uh, Zoe Saldana, who plays a horror, uh, she's a very good actress, you know, I'm sure everyone watching you've seen her in something. There are moments where they show, give her like, oh, she's a good, strong female character, but they do shift more over to uh, of this relationship with Spock being what's really her character about. Like, it's like, sometimes like, okay, good, a horror, but then it's like, oh, right, you and Spock are in a relationship and... You have to work shit out again. We get it. They have they should, they're in a relationship. They have problems. Yeah, it, it, the problem is it's always like a plot point in each one of these movies that they're that they're having relationship problems, and I think it detracts from who the character should be. There's some interesting changes that they're making to some of the characters that are moving them in new directions. Like we have uh, Sulu, who is revealed in this movie to be gay. Uh, which is something that's been uh, heavily debated among some people. Funny enough, George Takei, who uh, was the original actor who played Sulu, actually is against it, and he himself is a homosexual, and that's one of the reasons why Simon Pegg wrote him to be gay in this movie. It's kind of like a tribute to George Takei, but he, he's not supportive of it. It didn't feel forced. It didn't feel like it was shoved in yeah. your face. Yeah, no, they, they, they just show his family, and that's about it. They're just like, oh, well, he's gay, okay. Yeah, and, you know... Simple. The fact it is just, you know, a small factor to his character, I mean, it's just like, yeah, he's, he's gay, he just so happens to be gay, but it's not like it, it defines him in any way. I thought it was classy, and I think that it's about time there's, there's a homosexual uh, presence in the Star Trek universe, because it's supposed to be an all-inclusive universe, that we all kind of unified, and we all came together to put our differences aside and stuff. Simon Pegg, who co-wrote this movie, giving himself a pretty meaty role working with a new alien co-star who is played by uh, the lovely lady uh, from Kingsman, who is the henchman with the sword legs. Yeah, she is really cool in this film. Her character's name is Jayla. She's a white-faced, like, black-lined uh, alien that you see in all the trailers and in a lot of the, uh, and in one of the posters, too. Uh, she's a really cool character. I like her a lot. She's, she's cool. not, she's not too, she's awesome, but she's not too awesome. And don't go overboard with her. Um, she, she can fight. She's good with technology. She doesn't want to fight. She fights to survive. She doesn't fight because she loves to fight. She, she, she is very scared in moments in this film. It's good to see that vulnerability in her. You know, so we got the vulnerability, but we also got her being badass and, you know, cool and just fun to be around. So they got that good balance in her character. And I would personally really like to see this character come back in future films. Like, maybe she becomes a, a member of the crew. I think that would be a great well, addition to this new franchise. Well, as we all know, unfortunately, uh, recently, Star Trek has lost a member of its family. Anton Yelchin passed away in a tragic accident uh, with his vehicle. And this is his uh, final performance as Chekhov. And they uh, actually give him a, a lot more to do in this one than they have in the previous ones because he's teamed up with uh, Captain Kirk once they crash land on the planet. And uh, he gets some action scenes, he gets some stuff to do. But the one thought I had when you were talking about her character is that now that he is gone, the uh, statements that I have read from J.J. Abrams that he has no intention to recast Chekhov. Jayla would make a great um, you know, addition to kind of sit in for, uh, for that, uh, that part of the cast. Yeah. Uh, you know, so it would be cool moving forward if she, if she joined them, yeah. yes. And if they want to give an in-universe reason for why Chekhov's not there, they can simply just say he was reassigned to the Starship Reliant, as we saw in The Wrath of Khan. So they could kind of like another wink to the original timeline, which I think would be satisfying to most fans. One of the criticisms that I could make is that, uh, once again, the characters are all kind of spinning their wheels in the exact same troubles and issues that were... Uh, affecting them in the previous two movies. Once again, Kirk is still, you know, recovering from the loss of his father and still wondering about where he fits into everything and living under his father's shadow and, and Spock is still debating about his human side with his Vulcan heritage and which one is more powerful than the other and how Uhura fits into everything. 
they take a lot of screen time in the beginning discussing these things, and it'd be one thing if these were new developments for the characters, but these aren't new developments. These are retreading old territory. And it feels like in a sequel, especially with a movie called Star Trek Beyond, you should be taking us beyond what we've already seen. You should be giving us new character developments. And it should be heavily affected and influenced by the threat in the film. And I think a, a very reasonable criticism is that they take too much time establishing things that are already established and not enough time establishing other plot points in this movie. The Enterprise getting itself beaten half to shit every freaking movie. In the first film, the, the Romulan mining ship, because it's like decades ahead of it, its weapons technology just outdoes the Enterprise. The Enterprise isn't wrecked, but it's definitely disabled. Then in its darkness, Khan just wrecks it. Yeah, uses their like super mega battle starship and just blast the fuck out of it. It's all kinds of messed up. And then in this one, we totally see the Enterprise get destroyed. And it's actually a cool scene. The special effects in it work well. I it's like, like the, the swarm way, yeah, drone the, army. The swarm drone army comes in, and the way they, they dissect it and rip it apart in certain sections, uh, it looks really cool. It's, it's, it's a cool scene. But for the love of God, if we're in this new franchise, if we're having things be more fun and a little and more action oriented, can we see the fucking Enterprise kick some ass for for once? For the love of God, you know, just be some, some good, a little bit of strategy, a little bit of boom boom. That's all I want, you know. Have you ever seen a ship in the Star Trek universe take such a beating without a warp core breach? The things was so flashy that it was hard to think about while you're watching. You're yeah. just kind of with your mouth open. Yeah, so it was a good shot. It shot well, but yeah, it was impressive action. And the, the cells were being ripped from the backside of it, and like. You know, they even did a saucer separation, which it was kind of like remind me of the Generations crash sequence where they yeah. crashed on the planet, but there's some cool action scenes in this movie. I mean, I was uh, really engaged in the destruction of the Enterprise. There's an awesome action sequence in the crashed uh, saucer section of the Enterprise, and I, I really enjoyed it. It, was, it had some nice little twist to it. There, the Enterprise has a few tricks up her sleeve, as Kirk said, even though it's crashed. Uh, at least they did something a little bit more fresh than Into Darkness. The last one had so many elements that were borrowed from other things, most notably um, the uh, original series episode Space Seed and then the Re Re Wrath of Khan. This movie, they do some things different. I mean, we're on this new planet that has, like, you know, a unique environment. I think it was maybe a nice change to not have the adventure fully take place in space, how it was isolated to this planet and how you got to see them, you know, try and survive in this planet and everything. And they presented kind of unique opportunities for characters to interact with each other and all that. Yeah. So the special effects in this movie are really good. I'm really very pleased with that. Much as I usually have issues with uh, CGI heavy films, I, I think they did a great job. I really be believed 90 to 95 percent of the things that I was seeing. I thought it was just well shot. Everything looked realistic. The metal looked like metal. You know, rocks looked like rocks. Lasers looked like lasers. It was all looking really good. Especially in this movie. Now you see in the trailer uh, a city being attacked. But really what it is, is this giant space station called Yorktown. And it is, in my opinion, marvelous. It is basically like a bunch of, like, kind of like ring worlds intertwined with an outer shell uh, oxygen barrier around it. And it just looks incredible. And it has a docking base through the, like, the ring in the city. It just looks fantastic. There's some imagination in this city. Uh, for instance, at the epicenter of the city, uh, gravity is is kind of everywhere because they're they're trying to keep artificial gravity over these rings but if you end up in the middle then you're basically being pulled every which way and there's a pretty cool fight sequence yeah. inside the epicenter of York Yorktown near the end. Uh, the one thing I'll say is it kind of remind me of the uh, Elysium um, station in space. Uh, you know that was also a ring with artificial gravity and its own environment with like atmosphere. its own plant life atmosphere. It was a little reminiscent of that, but I mean, this is on a much grander scale. So yes, there is a lot of CG in this film, but I gotta say, there is a good amount of practical effects. There are a lot of actors on sets who are in makeup, or like, they've got some kind of prosthetic going on. A lot of them, in fact. In fact, at the end of the movie, they're like, the, while the crew is hanging out, there's Chekhov's uh, flirting with this one alien, and her head is huge. The actress in that thing, she must have been, have been uh, one tired neck at the end of the day, because that thing was big. Uh, and they all look great. Man, Chekhov is yeah. a little Don Juan in this movie. Every time someone wasn't trying to kill them, he was putting his arm around some girl. Hell, he even checked out Jayla when she had her back turned. He did a little... 
the makeup, the prosthetics, the coloring. I think uh, there, you know, a lot of these aliens that we get to see look really good. The music in this new uh, trilogy, I have not been a fan of. I feel that like the classic Trek scores by James Horner and Jerry Goldsmith are far beyond uh, and above what these scores are. You know, I gotta disagree with Mike on this one. As much really? As, yeah, as much as the original scores are always gonna have that place in my heart, and they're classics. They are full-blown sci-fi classic, uh, you know, scores. I think this one does a good job. Don't get me wrong, it could be worse, but is it on the same level of class? Hell no. Like, I, it, the melody is definitely not even near as fucking memorable as is good. And, like, it doesn't make me, it doesn't give me that Star Trek sense of exploration. It just gives me that sense of cartoony action. It, it, it just, it doesn't do the same thing for me at all in terms of feel. Um, I think the tone is totally off. We really want to talk about the villain, because this movie does have a lot of pros, but here's where the movie really does fall short. You have Idris Elba, which if you guys aren't familiar with him, you should be. He's awesome. He's a fantastic actor, and there's just something about this man when he's on screen that just, you know, you are zeroed into what he's doing. Great actor, and a villain that once they, we finally get to learn something about him, that's like, oh, well, that's interesting. But in a lot of ways, the villain falls short in this film. Spoilers. But the whole film, we're trying to figure this guy out. We know that he hates the Federation. We know that he wants to unleash this bioweapon upon them, which is never really explained. Do the villains in this series always have to be a psycho that wants to destroy the Federation? A little more variety and motivation and evil goals would be nice. Uh, especially in a movie with the word beyond in the title. We discover through the film that he has like this magical technology that can keep him uh, from aging that he talks about, but they don't really explain that either. What we do know is that this magical technology grants Krall immortality, but at the price of draining the life from others and taking in the, on the appearance of that species. But you're asking the whole movie about what is uh, motivating him. Where did he get the magical technology from? On the planet's surface, there is this crashed Starfleet ship called the USS Franklin. Apparently, it's been there for over a hundred years. Jayla and Scotty spend the movie trying to repair it so that they can eventually escape. Well, in the mess hall of the ship, there is footage playing on a monitor of the former crew. Of course, this is going to have a payoff eventually. And it's revealed that Idris Elba is in the footage. <gasps> and he is human. So, twist. Crawl is a Starfleet officer who captained the Franklin. And over the years, he's been twisted into a villain both physically and emotionally. This sounds cooler as I'm saying it than it is in the movie, because in the movie, once it is revealed that this is happening, they give us a spoon-fed exposition captain's log from him that lasts maybe a maximum of two minutes, more like one minute probably though, where he explains all this, and then we're just straight on to the finale. You know, no time to really think about it, no time to really acclimate to this information to absorb it and to let it really affect you in any way. We're just on. Forward. And there are so many questions left unanswered. In a, a character arc for point A, point B, point C, they gave you A and C, and they left out B almost entirely. Uh, we know certain things, okay, but it's very convenient, the answers. The answers are basically that everything he needed to become a supervillain was just left behind his planet by an ancient race hundreds of years ago. This race left behind is a technology that he uses to stay young, they left behind this bioweapon that he's going to use to destroy the Federation, and they left behind all this engineering equipment that he's using as his uh, militia army to attack the Enterprise and uh, later the Yorktown. It's very convenient, incredibly, and it's not really answered all the way, and it's very much so just magic technology. I really dislike that aspect of this new series and how they just kind of throw things at the audience and they're like, now look at a bunch of lens flares, look at a bunch of explosions, forget about, you know, explanations for how this works. Yeah, and I wasn't really surprised by the plot twist at all, because even before, like, they reveal all there was this crashed Federation ship that's been here for a hundred years. I knew it was going to be like the captain or like the first off. I knew it was, I, I knew the villains were going to have something to do. We're going to be the, the the surviving crew members because Crawl talks about the Federation like he knows them personally. Like he keeps talking like you Federation, you don't know sacrifice. How do you know so much? I mean, isn't the Enterprise the first time you've encountered these the Federation? Because oh, or. But you talk like you've encountered it before. The second, like, oh, there's a crash Federation ship here. Well, well, they're the survivors, aren't they? Like, I fucking knew it. One of my biggest criticisms with this reveal is that they wait so late in the movie to, to show you this twist that there's hardly any time for it to really work. If you reveal the sooner in the movie, 
and then you took a lot of time to develop his character and to maybe add more more reasons and motivations instead of wasting so much time beginning with with previously established uh, you know character arcs. I understand there was parallels between the characters of Kirk and Krau. Um, you know, they're almost like mirror images, like, you know, the good and the bad, uh, like a lot of, uh, you know, evil versus good storylines. But they're both disenchanted with Starfleet, and they both are motivated through this film by that. And uh, Kirk sees, uh, you know, the personification of, you know, like the worst that could happen if you, you know, lose touch with yourself and what your purpose is in life, which is what happened to Krau. And, uh, you know, he kind of re it redefines his, his meaning for being in Starfleet by the end of the movie. He was... Uh, a man who was a soldier uh, in the Earth government, and he fought in a war which I think they said it was against the Romulans. He was an explorer like the Star Trek crew that we know in any Star Trek incarnation. This guy was a soldier, and just after the war was over, the Federation was formed. Starfleet was formed uh, a few short years afterwards, and because of his incredible service work as a soldier, they made him the captain of their first deep uh, space vessel, the Franklin. Now, they really could have gone something cool here because they don't need soldiers anymore. The society had, after the war, the society had evolved past that. They don't need soldiers. So they could have done this really cool thing about like what happened in Japan like 150 years ago, I think, when they, when they were westernizing and they didn't need the samurai class anymore. And they told the samurai, well, you're not warriors anymore. You can be philosophers or you can be this, you can be that, but we don't need warriors. And that could have been a really cool aspect of the character, letting go of being a soldier because he doesn't know how to function in this new society that is peaceful that people don't have to hate and rip each other apart and steal and stuff he doesn't know and that could have been the motivation that twisted his mind to make him go to this extreme that they kept twisting it at the more extreme lengths he went to this character really could have had some incredible awesome depths to it in fact maybe it does have depth but they didn't explore it or at least flush it out all the way this character really could have been something phenomenal especially yeah. once again with Idris Elba playing the damn character I am very on board with what Vincent saying he made the character sound so much cooler than he was represented on screen Michael to the fan fiction boards go it kind of makes me wonder if there is a lot of deleted scenes left in the cutting room floor or something, because it feels like there's a lot of chunks of explanation missing from this movie. There is some things that were not thought through well enough in here. Um, but these are our biggest criticisms about the movie. I have one more criticism to throw in there. I just have to say this. I am not a fan of the song Sabotage. Sabotage! That said, though, there's a pretty cool sequence connected to it where our heroes figure out that they can disrupt the collective flight patterns of the drone ships they are swarming around to attack Yorktown by blocking their signal with music. It was a cool visual to see, like, the Franklin surf on this wave of drones and it's like they're uh, leaving wave fire, fire, yeah. leaving fire under it. It was a cool visual. Star Trek Beyond was definitely an improvement over the previous movie Into Darkness. It was good to get to see the entire cast play a role in this one, and they all worked really well together. There was some exciting action and effects in this, for sure, and I liked it was a little bit closer to the classic series, even though I think that maybe we can nudge it a little bit closer next time, but I still feel that there is maybe a little too much focus and action and spectacle rather than character and story. Still more improvement can be made. I think we're on the right path, though. I would have liked to have seen a bit more of the human condition layered in there. However, my biggest issue with this one was the villain, who I felt was thinly plotted and his backstory was weak. Still, I had fun with this one, and that's the most important thing you can say about a summer blockbuster. I think that in a summer that's been kind of disappointing, this one's one of the better ones of the summer, and I would recommend if you are trying to figure out what you want to spend your money on right now, this would be the movie to do it to. I really enjoyed it. I, I had a really good time once again. The folly of the villain in the film bugs me a lot, because the better a villain is, the better the heroes look. Um, I've said it before, I'll keep saying it. Um, so yeah, that really bugged me. However, the action was good, special effects were solid, uh, all the actors did a great job. Um, the pacing of the film was good. I didn't have any issues there. Uh, so yeah, I had a lot of fun. I think this movie has done its job to keep the franchise going and, would, and it's got me excited for the next film to come up, whatever it is, uh, probably hopefully just, no, just another two years from now. Uh, it's already been announced, actually. It's greenlit and Chris Hemsworth is on the cast list. Oh yeah, I forgot about that. Kirk's dad's coming back from the dead? I don't know. Let's Somehow? see. How? No, but anyway. So yeah, I really enjoyed this film. I would recommend you guys go check it out. Uh, a lot of cool stuff going on here. Um, yes, there's some faults, unfortunately. But uh, yeah, definitely, like Mike said, we're just going to go spend your money out there. As we said at the beginning of the video, we did do a ranking of the previous 12 Star Trek films. And in that video, I told you guys 
Yep, right there. There it is. <laughs> Sorry. Uh, viewer on. No, I'm good. Uh, I told you guys we would be placing it, this new film, in that list. So we're going to put Star Trek Beyond right in about seventh spot, right behind the, new, the first Star Trek of this new franchise. So one of the big reasons why, for me personally, and no one's going to be surprised after watching the video, what puts the first one ahead of Beyond is just the fact that we have a good villain. He's got simple motivations, but it's ones that people can understand. It's, you know, he lost his family and his whole world. Revenge! So because this, because the first one had a solid villain, that's why it's ahead of Beyond for me. Honestly, there are a lot of things I enjoy about Beyond more than the first 2009 movie. I'd say that the only reason that Beyond is ranked below it is that the 2009 movie was what pulled Star Trek from the grave, uh, when I wondered if I'd ever see it again. So, I have a soft spot for it because it saved the franchise, and that's why it's uh, listed a little bit above Beyond for me. Well, anyway guys, really hope you enjoyed the video. Please, tell us what you're thinking. It's Trekkers out there, leave your comments down below. We want to know all your thoughts, alright? Thank you for watching the video. Please subscribe to our channel here at Review of the Nerds. And until next time, I'm Vincent. And I'm Mike. And this has been Review, Review of the, the Nerds. Nerds. Live long and prosper.